I describe Austin as the kind of place, if you grow up in a small town in Texas or in the South, and you're different, it's a place to escape to. I remember moving there and just thinking, oh, this is all I really want. I just want to be here, watch movies, make movies. A lot of people thought, oh, you'd have to go to New York or LA to do what I do. But I was like, no, I'm just going to make it work here. And so I've been lucky. I've, that's, that's what I've done. Hi, I'm Richard Linklater, and this is the timeline of my career. Woodshot is good. Woodshot rules. Woodshock is amongst many short films I made uh, when I was really teaching myself how to make films. I'd been working in Super 8 up to then, and that was a fun excursion to my future of 16 millimeter stepping up in the world. But it was, it's a short in and around a blissed out um, drug fueled music festival in Austin in the summer of 85. No one involved remembered probably being filmed. Ecstasy was actually legal then. Interestingly enough, they were making it illegal in the fall. You know, I didn't have a lot of experience with film growing up other than going to them. I remember in junior high, I started playing with film a little bit. I had a tripod and my cousin and I shot some films that summer and got a little creative with it. I remember thinking, oh, I like film. I like film. I would do it. But I was playing sports and I was distracted. But it was always in the back of my mind. Film, I, I just liked the technical aspects of it. But I was into photography and any number of other things. But when I returned to it in my early 20s, I returned in a big way. What do you do to earn a living? You mean work? To hell with the kind of work you have to do to earn a living. All it does is fill the bellies of the pigs who exploit us. Hey, look at me. I'm making it. I may live badly, but at least I don't have to work to do it. The idea of Slacker came to me, I remember about two in the morning, I was driving late at night on a long trip alone, and the idea of the film, the narrative structure of the film kind of hit me in one shot. Like, why couldn't you tell a story that moves from one character to the next to the next? I was 23, just in love with cinema and its possibilities, and I was thinking, what is cinema? What can it do? What are its boundaries? So that idea of an experimental narrative kind of hit me and then stayed with me. And then six years later, I was actually making that film, but I thought about it for six years. So much of the content in Slacker is kind of found object art. Something I heard, it was in a conversation years earlier in Missoula, Montana, for instance, on the Madonna pap smear. A very intelligent, quirky friend of mine named Matt was theorizing on the pornography of the future. He said it might be Madonna pap smears. And so I just remember that as a, it's just a thought, not original to me, but out there in the world via a conversation I was in. And then it finds its way into this movie as a actual commodity. You know, there it is, a Madonna pap smear for sale. But I always give Matt credit for that. And I've run into him a couple times over the years, always fun. The movie is a little crazy, actually. Yeah, I haven't seen it just lately, but last time I did, I thought, oh, what a weird mindset I must have been in. Say, man, you got a joint? Uh, no, not on me, man. <laughs> It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> While making Slacker, I determined that, oh, my next film, I want to make, I have this teenage movie I want to make. It's just kids riding around looking for something to do. That was my central metaphor for that movie. But it was set in the 70s, you know, the music alone would be expensive, the recreation of the period. So it, it was quote unquote a real movie. You know, I got to make a very personal film about what I remember high school feeling like, all kind of synthesized through one night, you know, the last night of school in 1976. One of the great things about getting to do this is you, there is a cathartic aspect. You do get to recycle things from your own experience or that's where I, I really do work from a pretty specific autobiographical place at least as a jumping off point at the time we did days and confused there weren't a lot of teen movies there that the teen movie kind of ebbs and flows as being very popular in cinema or kind of going away it had kind of gone away so there weren't a lot of big teen stars i knew they were out there I, there's always talent there's so many great actors in the world i was most excited about trying to find them when i look back at that experience by far the most satisfying was just getting to know all them and work with them if you were to visit our set on a given night 
you know, there's Ben Affleck and Matthew McConaughey and there's Renee Zellweger, <laughs> who, although technically an extra, was immediately treated like a, because she was so cool, everybody liked her so much, she would sit at the table and have lunch with everybody. You know, she was Renee. It was Matthew's first movie. He, he wasn't an, an actor really at that point, but he'd come in on an audition and I just thought he was pretty perfect for this one part. You know, he got that guy. He looked me in the eye and said, hey, I'm not this guy, but I know this guy. Six weeks later, you're sitting there at lunch and I remember Matthew telling me, hey, I'm thinking about going out to LA. I'm like, really? Okay. That says a lot. You know, other people are like, hey, I'm going to finish college and go to law school. I'd be, okay. That too. You know, you can't project or ever know what's inside the performer. You know, some people just have to do it. Some people are born to do it. Some aren't sure if it's what they want to do. You know, so you, you can't really force these things. You know, I believe if there's any kind of God, it wouldn't be in any of us. Not you or me. But just this little space in between. If there's any kind of magic in this world, it must be in the attempt of understanding someone, sharing something. After doing two sprawling ensembles of Slacker and Dazed and Confused, I remember having this urge inside me to take those methods of how I kind of shape material and work with cast, I remember thinking, it's time to do that intimate story. And I'd been thinking about this since, I remember it was the fall of 89. I was just kind of leaving New York. I went through Philly and I was visiting my sister for one night and I was leaving the next day. And I just met this young woman at a toy store. My sister and I, we had wandered into a toy store and she was working there. She was kind of flirting with me. And we just had this kind of connection. And I did something I would never do. I'm kind of shy. I wrote her a little note and slipped it to her and said, hey, I'm in town for a night. You know, do you, you want to go get a drink? You know, do something after? And she wrote back, yeah, sure. I'm like, wow, okay. And so we really spent that whole night just walking around Philly. It was just kind of that, that magical thing that happens between people. The filmmaker that I am, you know, even that night I was very aware, I was going like, you know, I wanna make a film about this. I remember talking to her about it. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, this, you know, it's just, just this feeling, this feeling, this thing about discovering someone else, that infatuation, attraction, what it brings out in you. All that. I met Julie Delpy early on in the casting process. Like she was like the second actor I met, but she never went away. Ethan at that time was already a big star. I didn't know him. You know, you don't know an actor till you really meet them. But we started talking and I was like, I love the way this guy's mic works. And we're still talking. <laughs> 20, um, you know, six years later. That was a really special experience with 23 year old Julian Ethan with that particular story to tell that story it was kind of a little miracle, you know, that someone even gave me $2.7 million or whatever to go do that little, that little intimate film that was, didn't make sense on paper. Hey man, what are you doing here? I fancy myself the social lubricator of the dream world. Helping people become lucid a little easier. You know, cut out all that fear and anxiety stuff and just rock and roll. Waking Life probably has the longest gestation of any film I've ever done in that the idea for the story predated my interest in film even. It was based on a dream I had my senior year in high school. That moved around in my head for 20 years and it never worked. The film in my head didn't work. It was too literal, it just did never worked. But when I saw this animation sample that these friends of mine were working on, it was this kind of computer-based version of rotoscoping. And I was like, oh, it just hit me rather quickly. It was one of those great mashups of collision of like form and content. This idea I had, suddenly I go, that thing that doesn't work in my head will work if it looks like that. We were off to the races. I started talking to them about it. And again, it was a film I couldn't really explain. That's when I know I'm in good territory, when I can't really explain the film I'm working on. It wasn't conventionally scripted. I had pages of notes and dialogues and ideas and scenes. And again, another one of those miracles of like, okay, can I get this film made? I remember at the time personally just thinking, like I was having trouble getting other movies made too. It was kind of a default, I kind of thought, I'm just gonna, maybe this will be the last movie I ever make. I mean, no one wants to give me money to make a movie. I'd made some movies that hadn't done well. So I was like, okay, this is maybe the last movie. You know, I just remember thinking I'm pouring everything into this one movie. I think it's a good way to work. Lawrence is good at piano. He shall be rocking in my show. 
Stop. That's perfect. You're perfect. Stay right there. In a way, like School of Rock, I feel like I've been in a, in some way building up to that for a long time and not so much the immediate subject matter of it, but just the idea that I would do something like that. I always saw the challenge of like, you know, studio comedies. Like I think, oh, I'm a comedy director. Everything I do is funny. But to see like an overt comedy, I was always kind of critical of a lot of those. I had this opportunity. It's like, well, put your money where your mouth is. You know, let's see if you can make a studio comedy. And it came to me at the right time. You know, I had turned down things for like 10 years. The producer, Scott Rudin, deserves really the, the matchmaking credit here because I instinctually did pass on it. I was like, oh, it's kind of cheesy. And then I got a call like, well, Scott Rudin's not accepting your pass. You need to talk to him. I said, well, what the hell does that mean? Okay, I'll talk to him. Another thing, as a parent, my daughter was exactly the age of those kids. I think had I not had a daughter that age, I, I would not have been good for that movie. And something in Jack's character I found very personal to me, kind of the, the slacker who society's looking down their nose at is not productive person. But in fact, he does have something to offer society. We just had fun creatively. It, it made me look at things and go, well, am I gonna have fun creatively? I'm working with good people. It opened my cinematic horizons a little bit to think, okay, a story can, I can work in the industry in a certain way and have fun with that and be successful with it. Don't worry about it. Looks like you use the bumpers. You don't want the bumpers. Life doesn't give you bumpers. Unlike other films that I can say, I had this, you know, multi-year gestations and, you know, 20 years, 10 years thinking about, Boyhood actually had a very brief gestation. What it had was the big idea that engendered the long process of making it. I guess as a parent, I, I started thinking about, I had a film to make about childhood. And when you talk about depicting children, you're very limited to a moment in their life. You can't ask, for instance, a seven-year-old, you can't, okay, now you're playing 11 years old. Now you're playing, you know, and I realized I had a bigger story to tell, but I couldn't crack it physically with the limitation of the actors. And so I was just having trouble cracking the narrative of what I was trying to express about growing up. It just wasn't working in my head and I'd given up on it. I thought, okay, I'm gonna return to my teenage ambition and write a novel. And I sat down at a keyboard on my computer to write and the idea for Boyhood hit me at that very moment. Oh wait, what if you filmed a little bit every year? Yeah, and then, cause I was gonna depict first through 12th grade, and if I filmed it 12 times, 12 shorts put together with transitions, yeah, it would, yeah, the, I could just, I saw the final film in one poof. It came to me in, in a flash, and then I just got going on it. You know, I got Ethan and Patricia, and luckily IFC gave me a couple hundred thousand a year to make it, and we just started. Summer 02, and with no end in sight, 12 years is a long way, very abstract. I'd say about halfway through, we started to feel like, okay, it's like, you know, and it, it matured. It got better every year just because the kids came into their own more. Eller and Lorelai, my, my daughter who plays a sister. When we got to the end, the momentum every year, the last three or four years just increased. You could feel the gravitational pull of the end. The landing point was coming and each year got better and better. Every year we looked at each other and said, this is the best year ever. And I realized that's how it feels growing up. Bernadette. Bernadette. Oof. So Megan Ellison, she had asked me if I had read this book, Where'd You Go Bernadette? I hadn't, I had heard about it. She was talking about how much she liked it and that she doesn't really develop a lot of things, but this book she was kind of obsessed with. I read the book and I'm like, oh yeah, a complex character, this Bernadette. And my, my personal jumping off point was my mom. She reminded me of my mom in a way. My mom was very brilliant, was very brilliant pretty erratic. The themes of the book, the complexity of this character, Bernadette, obviously, but then also this obsessive parenting, mother-daughter relationship. And it's also a depiction of an artist who's just not creating their art, which is the scariest thing in the world. So there were so many, I felt, deep areas worth exploring that I talked to Megan about them. And uh, we said, well, let's do it. You know, and that was years ago, but here we are with a finished film. and. Bless uh, Kate Blanchett. I think when you see the movie, you can't think of anyone else playing it. If you go back and read the book, it'll just be Kate in your head because she is Bernadette.
Just when you think, you know, 20 films in, I know what I'm doing. It's kind of like, I think you do this to challenge yourself. It really pushed my cinematic thinking of like, okay, well, what can films do that books can't? But I, I like that as a challenge.